Hello everyone, I greet in the name of God Almighty. My name is Apostle Newton Silas and I'm here with Nancy Christ. And today guys, we have a very interesting video to react to. And this one says that Western scholar ac accidentally proved Quran auto not human, of course. It was not a human. We all know it was Angel Gabriel. But of course, let's get down to the video, then we can be able to like know who he is referring to as the author of the Quran. So if today happens to be the first time of you checking out my channel, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and follow me on my Facebook and Instagram. And if you have any video you want me to react to, don't forget to drop it at the comment section and I'm going to check it out. So guys, before we get on to the video, I'm a theologian and I make this video not to discredit anyone's religion. This is basically for educational purposes and I believe that at the end of this video, we all are going to learn from it. So let's get down to the video and check this out. Secular Quran academics claim the Arabic Quran is not divine, but a cultural product of the Arabs, written by an Arab or Arabs somewhere in or around Arabia. The culture that produced the other great cultural product of the Arabs, Jahili poetry, also known as the Diwan al-Arab, archive of the Arabs, must have also produced the Qur'an. It's just common sense. If the source of both are the same, i.e. the Arab culture, surely the ontological worldview observed in the pre-Islamic poetry would be mirrored in the Qur'an, since much of the finest Arabic poetry was written in the preceding 6th century and in parallel with the Qur'an in the 7th we ought to see a significant thematic overlap. That's just obvious. Evidence of conceptual borrowing between poetry and the Qur'an would indicate a common human origin, namely the cultural milieu of the Arabs. Therefore, the Qur'an isn't divine, but of human origin. So, what's the truth? Brothers and sisters, highly acclaimed secular professor Angelica Newith, whom I've introduced you to in a previous video, will now demonstrate whether we find this historic literary and philosophical convergence. The professor is a world-leading German Islamic studies scholar and professor of Quranic studies at Frey University in Berlin, also a visiting professor at the University of Jordan in Amman. Her research focuses on Quran studies, classical and modern Arabic literature, Arab late antiquity studies. She has taught at the universities of Munich, Amman, Bamberg and Cairo. Ideas put forward in these texts is however limited to their uh, particular milieu, which can be captured through an equally limited scope of literary genres. It's not at all surprising that the 6th century Arabs were interested in writing poetry about their immediate desert environment. Here are the themes and genres we find in their writings. Arab inscriptions, they are extremely short and mostly dedicated to private, mostly, ephemeral issues. The content of the other great source of early Arabic writing, rock inscriptions, are of the same intimate kind. Love, sickness, death and longing. Important to note is the almost total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced if we do not concede one important exception. There is arguably a serious philosophical interest lurking in the nasib. I'm going to underline this because it's important. Remember, she's describing pre-Islamic poetry here. Quote, The almost total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced. This she will next compare with the Qur'an, a book produced, supposedly, by the same ethno-linguistic group. It's a striking fact then that the Quran appears seemingly, seemingly out of the void as a full-fledged discursive text, extensive in range and replete with theological and philosophical queries. So a complete 180. Where the poetry lacks these significant literary characteristics, the Quran is, quote, 
replete with theological and philosophical queries. So it's not surprising that this observation has been vexing Western scholars for generations. The Quran's surprising richness of ideas and its consummate form. The striking disparity between the rudimentary Arabic poetry on the one hand and the richness of the Arabic Quran on the other in terms of its intellectual sophistication is for academics understandably quite vexing. But recall, Angelica Newith made an exception with the Naseeb. Now this is where it gets deep and really interesting. The Nasib, the poet's nostalgic lament on the site of the ruined encampment where he remembers a happy past in the company of his friends and his mistress. The Nasib is uniquely open to poetical introspection. Angelica Newith is describing the introductory Nasib of the poems which are famously sad and always conjure the image of a ruined Bedouin encampment. The poet laments a happy but lost past with friends and the departure of his beloved. The message of the Nasib is always, love and happiness is fleeting. Man is helpless before his fate. It is also in the Nasib the poet will often introduce the audience to what should be a very familiar word to all Muslims, Wahi, which in the poems is deployed as a powerful metaphor. In the context of Jahili poetry, it refers to a nonverbal sign or inexplicable graffiti on a desert rock. And shapes in the poet's eyes represent not a valid sign system, uh, but an empty signifier, reflecting the devastated states, uh, state of the poet's past, of his encampment, which is erased to the ground. And writing then, represented by Wahi in pre-Islamic poetry, is a kind of shorthand sign for the negation of the validity and relevance of Muruwa, the Bedouin world view. Okay, so there's a lot to take in. Let's break it down. In these Jahili poems, the opening, the Naseeb, is always the same. The persona in the poem is observing a wahi, an enigmatic sign on rock, and feeling a profound despair. These mysterious graffiti represent the obliterated past and leave the poet feeling confused and pessimistic about his present and future existence. Symbolizing, uh, quote, the permanence of nature and the impermanence of culture. The poetic wahi, i.e., the confusing rock inscriptions represent an existential crisis facing the Bedouin. This is the disconcerting worldview of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Life is pointless, for all good things perish. It is also more striking then to find that this wahi of loss, a wahi that remains mute, has been inverted in the Quranic lexicon. Wahi in the Quran denotes inspiration. It even successively acquires the meaning of revelation, ayat, signs, epistemic tools that disclose to the listener the hidden significance of his surrounding. The mute and foreboding wahi of poetry that left the poet depressed, signifying pessimism, has literally been flipped 180 in the Quran. The term wahi in the Quran is no longer a perplexing graffiti that throws the poet headlong into aporia. The negative wahi now signifies a positive sign, a revelation, inspiration. Subhanallah. So instead of the wahi mystifying life, the Quranic wahi re-enchants it by literally and symbolically descending as a revelation to unveil the secrets of the universe. This reimagined wahi rouses in the once beleaguered poet a newfound vitality and a sense of personal meaning for the arc of life. It is this perception of the world that the Quran addresses. God himself takes over the role of fate and reshapes the time of man, which is no longer cyclical but expands from primordial 
their creation to its end on Judgment Day. The Bedouin worldview is turned on its head. What was once willful fate, annihilating culture and rampaging through civilization in poetry, is replaced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Whereas a Muslim is now able to shape his fate through the intentional act of worship and ritual dedication, deaf and mute fate, which doesn't respond to anybody, has been displaced by a listening and benevolent God. Death is no longer the end of everything you savor. What you do in life is judged and it determines your afterlife. You now have the promise of eternal bliss to help you find meaning in this life. Ultimately, the anthropocentric worldview has been displaced by a theocentric one. The individualistic, heroic, wine-drinking hedonism of Jahiliya has been supplanted by a God-centered theological system that now values discipline and personal accountability held inside a profound covenantal bond reaching into the annals of history. The Qur'an doesn't just hail a new moral vision and thereby an existential break from the past. It initiates a paradigm shift by directly challenging and turning the old ontological assumptions on their head. It's one thing to chart a new course, but to say to an entire civilization everything they knew for a thousand years is wrong and the opposite is true and the brazen way Allah does so is just an astounding feat. Let's now get to the heart of the video. Are the people and culture who produced the Jali poetry also responsible for the 7th century Qur'an, therefore both are of human origin? The answer is a resounding no. Frankly, the worldview in the poetry and the Qur'an are diametrically opposed. In summary, the Qur'an has a positive message of hope. The signs and world reveal the purpose of life. You shape your own life, a final judgment, your actions in form, an afterlife that depends on your actions. Whereas the pre-Islamic poetry has a depressing message of a pointless life. Signs on rocks are mute and confusing. Non-negotiable fate and not God controls life. No final judgment, no afterlife. So on account of this strong conceptual animosity, the only reasonable conclusion is the Quran could not have been a product of the Qasida producing Arabs. It means that the Quran comes as a sudden disclosure in Arabic language of until then unspoken of or at least unattested discursive ideas. I propose to read the Quran as nothing less than the document of a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution. With words like sudden disclosure, unattested, until then unspoken, a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution, there is no doubt in Angelica Newith's mind the writing of the pre-Islamic Arabs and the writing in the Qur'an cannot be compared. Okay, so, if the masters of the Arabic lexicon didn't write the ultimate literary masterpiece in Arabic, the Qur'an, who on earth did? Well, that's a very um, interesting um, video by uh, Professor uh, Angelica. But I think one of my problems with the West sometimes is that they feels like because there is education, so they can just write anything that they like, you understand, and then relate it to religion and then feels like they are educated or feels like whatever they are saying is right and then they expect people, you understand, to accept it and take it, you understand, as the right way. Look at this same scenario. She tried to what to equate, you understand, the Quran with the um, Arabic or should I say the Arab, you understand, poetry. How does those things, in a sense, has to do with each other. Whereas the Quran is talking about you understand faith and your set of morals and how you should live so that and knowing fully where well that you are just here on a temporal basis that what there is actually an afterlife and then the afterlife afterlife is all about what the result of your action here on earth. So the thing is people normally feel like because of because of education they can just write whatever they like and that's why I see she went on to relate you understand the Quran you understand with in a standard Arabic um, poetry, which is what wrong does for my own um, opinion. I feel like being a professor does not mean that you just have to write everything or because you just want people to know about you, so you just write whatever you feel as to just write. We all understand, you understand what the Quran is all about. It's about what the judgment day, and it's been expected of you to live by a certain set of morals and then values right so that if you're able to do so then you are going to what to have 
after like this after what judgment day it means that your action will play a major role in you making it to the genre or not but then hearing her you understand going on writing whatever she feels has to write you understand in the name of trying to make her own opinion or whatever she think is a researcher because she feels like i'm a professor and i'm i thought in this so and so uh, institution is just enough you understand for me me i just feel disappointed you understand in this uh, very article or whatever you understand that she think you understand she is writing but then everything happens to be my own um opinion okay this means my own personal um opinion you understand i have concerning what you understand she is writing because those two you understand means different thing we all know that god revealed you understand the quran to prophet um muhammad through angels um gabriel but she trying to make her deductions by bringing you understand the poetry and history and all those things those are the those are the ways that they normally do by misleading people and then before you know people begin to bring so many kind of doctrines you understand into the place of worship and then they will just mislead people you understand to hellfire that's exactly what is going to happen if care is not a uh, I hope that they will take this video, you understand, very seriously, you understand, and condemn this kind of act because if not well taken, a well taken, you understand, it will lead people, you understand, to eternal and hellfire. But then let's hear from you, Nancy. Very interesting video. Yeah. Guys, you have, you have said a lot, and I believe this is her own opinion. Yeah. And where I just want to point out my own opinion and contribution is based on that what Quran is all about and the conclusion that Quran cannot be compared. Yes, I believe because it's the word, word of God inspired by a prophet a, a, to, to write Quran, so it cannot be compared. You don't just compare something to another religion. Yeah. So we still believe some of the things that God have inspired the prophet to write about for for instruction for guidance and all that and we are here and i'm very much uh, happy that i have learned a lot through le uh, doing this and learning a lot from this quran and also that it's all about the the judgment day and all that so all i just have to contribute is just for us to be careful the way we live our lives and we don't need to take everything that anybody has said or what the Quran have said or what the Bible said is just what the God says the way he said we should live our life so let's be mindful of the way we live our life or what not just fall into the trap of anybody what they are saying so let's just follow the teachings of God what he have commanded us to do we are in the end time so let's be careful the way we live our lives so that we will not fall into prayer so that we can be able to make it to heaven to Jannah all right so guys this is the end of our video if you like our reaction you should like share and subscribe and if you have any video you want me to react to don't forget to drop it at the comment section and i'm going to check it out so guys you remain blessed and i see you in my next video bye bye